Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, A.J. Hogue, where A.J.'s more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's A.J. with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. Hi, I'm A.J. Hogue, the author of Effortless English, Learn to Speak English Like a Native. Join my VIP program, train English with me, commit to my VIP program to speak English powerfully, speak English fluently, speak English effortlessly. You got to commit, keep working on it, join the VIP program and commit each week, each month, each year. You will get better and better and better and better. That I promise you. Join and commit to my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. EffortlessEnglishClub.com. We're live on Facebook. Live. Doing a book club show today. Live, live, live. We're back with another book. We finished our previous book, The Alchemist, and now we have a new book, our new book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, another big bestseller, a little bit old, but a really good one, kind of another classic self-help book, you might call it, uh, the writer Stephen Covey, Stephen Covey. An American, he's not alive anymore. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Today we will discuss and learn Chapter 1, the first chapter. Now, as you know, I do audio podcasts a lot. A lot of audio podcasts. Not quite every day, but close to every day, I do an audio podcast. Audio only, no video, no YouTube, no Facebook, just my audio podcast. That's most of the Effortless English show is an audio show. So be sure to get my audio podcast. Of course, it's free, but you need a a podcast app to get it. You just need any podcast app, really. All the big podcast apps have my podcast. So that includes iTunes, if you use Apple, Podcast Addict. Tune in. I don't know. There's lots of them. Lots of them. Just get one of them, whichever like you like the best, and then uh, find Effortless English Podcast. Effortless English Podcast. Subscribe. You'll get each new audio podcast automatically. Okay, so we're live on Facebook now, and everyone's saying hello here. Let's go through quickly and say hello back. So... Gufran, hello. Brazil. Hello, Brazil. Very nice. Hey, Coach, how you doing? Doing well. Dalal, thanks for asking. Good to see you again. Asma, good to see you again also. Hello from Iran. Iran. Egypt. Hello from Dubai. Luxembourg. Hey, I think you're the first Luxembourg person to say hello. Melam, so hey. Tajikistan. Nice. Hello, hello. Asina, hello, welcome back. Brazil again, Francisco, thank you. Austin, Texas. Nora in Austin, Texas. <laughs> nice. All right, Russia, Vasily, nice. Hello, Vasily. Umesh from India. So you can see we're all over the world. Myanmar, Burma, also known as Burma, the old name. India again. Brazil, Brazil. So lots and lots and lots of places say hello. Kurdistan, France, Vietnam, Hungary. Hey, Lisa, how you doing? Kiev, Ukraine, excellent Turkey, Germany. Man, we're all over, see? Mozambique, Belarus, Manchester, Manchester, England, Iraq, Nepal, Torino, Italia. Ah, Italia. Poland, Romania, Thailand, Pumrak Thai, Bangkok, Thailand again. Wow, Philippines, Iraq, 
Afghanistan, woo, Bangladesh, Moscow, Algeria, whoo. All right. So hello all around the world. You can see just from our my quick reading of introductions, the Effortless English uh, community, family, is very international. Asia, Europe, and the United States there, South America, North America, all over the place. So welcome, everybody. Let's just get started, shall we? Um, let's see. Chapter one. Now, I have been talking about the introduction this week for the audio podcast. No video, but in the audio podcast, I talked about the introduction to this book. There's a nice introduction, a very nice introduction. Some books, uh, a lot of books, the introduction, eh, kind of boring, right? Very short, usually. Some, A lot of time, many times for books, I'll read the introduction very fast or skip it because often they're not that good. But actually... This book has a very nice introduction um, with some very, very um, kind of deep ideas. So I discussed those this week in a couple of podcasts. It took me a couple of podcasts to talk about the introduction to this book. So already we have a nice start to the book. But let's just go on now and start chapter one. As, as always, I will go through first and just summarize the chapter. So I'll just kind of read through the main ideas, give you the main ideas, my opinion, of course, but my opinion of the main ideas. Then I'll go back, I'll discuss with you, tell you my thoughts, you know, my opinions about the meaning of these ideas. And then finally, we will do the live questions and comments. That's how we do it. Here we go. Let's begin chapter one. So those of you live on Facebook, just relax for now. I'm, I won't be lit reading comments for a while, but I will later. Here we go. Chapter one. Habit one, be proactive. So this book is, has seven habits, just like the title says, seven habits. Chapter one, habit one. Habit one is be proactive. Very nice. Of course, this comes... The root word here is active. Active means to take action. Pro. Pro gives here the idea means kind of positive action. Take positive action. And we're using this as an adjective. So be proactive means be a person who takes action. Be a person who takes positive action. Taking positive action is the first habit to be effective. We'll talk more about this idea of effectiveness too. Okay, the chapter one begins with a quote from uh, probably my favorite writer, certainly my favorite American writer, Henry David Thoreau. And the quote says, I know of no more encouraging fact than the unquestionable ability of man, meaning humans, to elevate his life by conscious endeavor. Endeavor means effort here. Endeavor means action, effort and action. So what does that quote mean? Thoreau saying the most optimistic thing about life, the, the most encouraging thing to him, the most positive thing to him about life, is that man, meaning humans, meaning you or me, any human, any individual, can elevate, can raise, can improve their life with effort. Anyone can do this with effort, with action. Anyone, any person can become better, can have a better life, can be happier, can be, you know, more successful, whatever you decide. But that this is such a great positive thing. So even if your life is very bad in the beginning or now, the great news is that with effort, with the right effort and the right action, it can become better. We can become better. I agree with Mr. Thoreau. Okay, next, um, Stephen Covey begins, the writer. And he says, uh, he has like a little exercise. He, he says, uh, look at yourself. Pretend that you are a, another person. So he's saying, you know, look at yourself. Like, imagine you're looking in a mirror and you're looking at yourself. 
and observe yourself is what he's saying. Observe yourself right now. And notice, notice, how do you feel right now? Like what, are you in a good mood or a bad mood? Are you tired? Are you energetic? Are you excited? How are you feeling right now? Step two, notice your mind just for a second. What are you thinking? Notice your thoughts. Of course, you're listening to me right now, so you're probably just thinking about what I'm talking about. Then he says, this, this little exercise, what you just did, you know, imagining yourself, noticing your feelings and your thinking, thinking about your own thoughts, is something very human, very special. It's called self-awareness. Self-awareness. Awareness of your own mind. That's the real secret here. The ability to think about your thinking. Now, I would say it a little differently than he says it, but that's how he says it. He says, you can think about your own thinking, right? You can think about your own feelings. You can think, oh, you know, I feel bad right now. Oh, you know, I feel tired. Oh, you know, I'm right now I'm thinking very negative thoughts. Or right now I'm thinking very positive thoughts. So you're thinking about your thinking. You're watching your own thinking. You're watching yourself. There's something higher in you that can watch everything else inside of your own mind. That's called self-awareness. Self-awareness. And we, we think, he, he says, only humans can do this. But I, I'm not sure we really know that is true. <laughs> but... Um, we believe only humans can do this. I don't know. There might be other animals that can do it also. We're not sure because they can't talk to us. All right. Then the next section is called the social mirror. The social mirror. So we have another. So this is the first way we know ourselves, right? We can know ourselves just by watching ourselves, watching our own feelings, watching our own thinking watching our own actions. There's something, some kind of, something high, you might call it spirit or soul, that in you that can watch everything else inside of you. It's kind of interesting, actually. When you really think about it, it's quite powerful and interesting and a little mysterious even. Well, the second way we can know ourselves is what he calls the social mirror. The social mirror, that's other people's opinion of you. That's what other people think about you, right? And how do you know? Well, they tell you, right? They say, oh, you're, you're ugly, you're stupid, you're foolish, you're, or maybe something, you know, good. You're creative, you're intelligent, you're wonderful, you're beautiful. So these are the opinions of other people. It's kind of like a mirror, right? You're, you hear these opinions from other people, and this makes you, gives you an idea of yourself, it maybe changes your opinion about yourself, depending on what other people see and what other people think. That's called the social mirror, he says. That's what he calls it. But he says the social mirror is dangerous. You have to be very, very careful about the social mirror because it's not, it's not true. It's, it's more, it's, it's much more, um, I was going to say distorted, which means not clear and sometimes completely wrong. You know this, right? Like, for example, I'll give you an easy example. Maybe I'm, uh, I'm feeling very quiet and peaceful one day. I'm, I'm sitting in a restaurant and I'm just peaceful. So my face, just peaceful, just kind of hmm, like this. Now, I know I'm feeling very peaceful, but maybe someone next to me looks at me and they think I'm angry. They look at my face. I'm not smiling. Maybe they say, oh, my God, they're thinking. Or maybe they say, oh, this guy's angry. This guy's in a bad mood. What's wrong with you? Why are you in a bad mood? Now, I, you know, we all do this, right? We look at someone. My wife always yells at me when I do this, right? <laughs> I look at her and maybe she's tired and I'll say, are you in a bad mood? No, I'm not in a bad mood. <laughs> right? So we can all do this, right? It's not accurate because we, we don't know what other people are thinking really. And other people don't know what you're feeling and they don't know what you're really thinking. So you have to be very careful about their opinions because they're not, often they're not correct.
All right, next he talks about what is called determinism. Determinism. Basically, this is just an e, uh, kind of a difficult word. It just means that you have no choice in life. That you have no freedom and you have no choice. That some people believe you have no choice. They believe that, for example, because of your genetics, right? Your biology. That determines, it decides your whole life. And the, you, there's nothing you can do about it, right? If you're a weak person, you're born with small muscles and, and weak, then you're going to be weak your whole life. Others, he says another kind is what he calls psychic or social. And this means uh, determinism. This means it's your parents, your childhood decides everything. So if you had a bad childhood, it means your adult life will be bad. You'll be unhappy your whole life because you had an unhappy childhood. And the third kind is called environmental. This just means, you know, what's around you. So if, if everything around you is bad and negative, it means you will have a bad life or you'll have a bad day or whatever. But the thing that's the same about these three is that the outside is deciding, not you on the inside. Okay, next, the next section, between stimulus and response. Stimulus and response. So this idea of determinism, right, that you, you're not free, this idea comes from the belief that Things happen to you, and then you react, right? Then you respond, and you have no real freedom or choice about that. So, for example, um, I don't know, if you have a, let's say somebody's bad, you know, mean to you. You go to a coffee shop, and the worker is very rude and very in a bad mood and they're mean to you. Yeah, what do you want? Uh, right? And so they're, they're mean to you. And so therefore, you feel bad. You're like, oh, now I'm in a bad mood. So this is the idea that you have no choice, right? Something bad happened to you. Therefore, you must feel bad. Therefore, you have no freedom. But then Stephen Covey tells a story, famous story. that shows this is the, a wrong idea. It's not true. And it's a story about Viktor Frankl. He wrote a story about being in a prison camp in World War II. And, of course, it was terrible, lots of suffering, all kinds of terrible stuff. Um, but this guy, he was in this terrible, terrible, terrible situation. But he noticed that actually we do have freedom, that many, many, many bad things can happen to us. But we can choose our reaction. We can choose how we respond, what we do, how we feel. That's our choice. We do have freedom. Even if everything's bad, we can choose not to feel bad. We can choose to think differently. And we can choose to take different actions. That's where our freedom is. Of course, we cannot avoid bad things. That's impossible. But we can choose how we react to them, what we do about them, how we think about them, all of that. That's where we have freedom of choice, free will, some people call it. And that this is, in fact, our greatest human power, individually, you and me. This is our number one power in life, the ability to choose our thinking, choose our feelings, and choose our actions, that we have that power to choose. Now, many people do not use that power. Many people don't. They only just react automatically. They don't really think about their reactions. They don't think about their feelings. They don't think about their thoughts, right? And they feel, those people don't feel free. But in fact, you are free and you can make that choice. Every moment you can do it. Okay, now we come to the... Uh, the main vocabulary word of this chapter, proactive. Here we have the noun, proactivity. So what does he say about it? 
So he his idea he's this is not a dictionary definition this is his definition. It means being responsible for your own life. Being responsible for your own life. That means you're the master of your own life. You decide in your mind and you feel and you know that you are the boss of your own life. You don't blame everybody else. It's no one else's decision. It's you. You have that freedom and you have that ability. So he says, proactive people, highly proactive people, do not blame the environment. They do not blame the situation. They choose, they choose consciously how to feel, how to act. And you have a nice, there's, in the book there's a little uh, image here. And it shows stimulus, that means what happens from the outside. And then on the right, there's response. That's what you do. And in the middle, he says, there's a little label. It says, freedom to choose. And then he gives examples. Self-awareness, imagination, right? Creativity. Conscience, that means your morals, what's right and wrong. Independent will, that's your ability to choose and decide yourself. Those are in the middle. That's where your freedom is. Next, he uh, talks about the opposite kind of person, a reactive person. So he's showing proactive and reactive. What's the difference? Reactive people, they do the opposite. They blame others. They react, meaning it's kind of like they have automatic reactions, like they're programmed, right? Something bad happens, they feel bad. They don't think there's no, there's nothing in the middle, right? It's just like a program. And of course it is possible. Like we, we can train dogs, for example, to just, you do, you, you do, you tell, you say something and they do it. You can train children that way too. And in some ways, of course, we need some of these reactions. These programmed reactions are necessary to make life easier, but we should choose them. We need, whenever there's an area of life where we're not happy, we need to stop and look and look at the middle between what happens and what we do. We need to look at the middle and choose, make sure we're choosing the reaction, the action that we want. So reactive people, the opposite of proactive, he's using this in a negative way, reactive people, they are controlled by their feelings and they're controlled by the outside by the environment, by other people. Reactive people are controlled by the outside, not the inside of themselves. Okay. Then he tells a little story. I'm going to kind of skip the story because it's not all that important, I think. But here's the next point about this because it's, uh, the, the story talks about how, you know, some, some people don't like this idea. They get, they get a little angry about it because, um, they feel like they're being blamed. Like, well, if something bad happens, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. Which, of course, is true. Bad things happen. Uh, many times, bad things or uncomfortable things or just things we don't like happen all the time, small and sometimes big. And, of course, you don't cause those things. because, But you're not a god. You can't control the world. Sometimes you have bad luck. Uh, sometimes just bad things happen because that's life and it cannot be avoided. Um, so he says, of course, of course, things can hurt us. Of course, things can hurt us. They can hurt us physically, right? You can be physically attacked. Someone can punch you or stab you or even shoot you. Bad things like that happen. Of course, that can happen. Um, you can have bad economic things can happen you know, with money, Um Sickness, um, emotionally, people can hurt your feelings. All lots of bad stuff can happen. We all know this. But it's it's what happens next. That's what he's saying. Where your power is, of course, all the bad stuff can happen. But then, it's choosing what to do next. That's where your power is. That too many people 
don't think about it. They don't slow down. They don't stop. They just react from their emotions, right? Something bad happens. They feel bad emotions, of course, and then they do stupid things or they do negative things or they just focus on the negative emotion and just feel worse and worse and worse and worse. And their life gets worse and worse and worse because they're making bad choices or they're not really thinking at all about their choice. So he's saying that a proactive person, the same thing happens, the same bad things happen. But then the next step, that's where the power is for you. That's where your freedom is, is to stop and to think and to notice, okay, I'm feeling really sad. I'm feeling depressed. I'm feeling angry, whatever. But what should I do next? And, and to think about it and to try to be creative and to choose things that will help you long term and even help you more now so that your choice is better, smarter, more effective. That's why the book is titled More Effective, right? Seven Habits of Effective People, Highly Effective People. He gives an example now, uh, a kind of a powerful example, really, of a woman, a friend, a close friend of his that was dying, dying of... Uh, uh, some disease, I'm not sure which disease, but but dying kind of a slower death. Well, that's sad. That's super sad. Um, it's also unavoidable, I mean, right? Because all of us will die at some point. Uh, but then he tells the story about how this woman who was dying, she, you know, of course, she made a choice. She didn't, of course, she felt sad and scared, all of that, of course, like everybody else. But then she stopped and she really thought about it and she... And she decided to, her actions would try, she'd try to be positive and try to do good things at the end of her life. So she wrote letters to her children, for example. And she even recorded audios for her children later in their life. She knew she would be gone. So she recorded like audio message, messages, <clears throat> excuse me, audio messages for them for when they got older to give them advice or just tell them she loved them. And she did a lot of things like this, kind of caring for lots of people in her life. And he said, you know, everyone around her, this, had a, this was a strong effect on them because she was so uh, caring as she died and that, this, that everybody remembers this and that it was such a positive and powerful thing and that she ended her life in such an amazing, powerful, good way. So that's a... That's a very big example of what he's talking about. Okay, next, next section. Taking the initiative. That's a kind of an idiom, I guess, in English. Take the initiative. We use this word take and initiative. We usually use them together. These words go together. So take the initiative. To take the initiative means to act first. Take action first. The initiative. Initiative comes from the word for one or to initiate means to start right so it, it means it means you start the action right for reaction reaction it means you're it has the idea of you're waiting right something happens in the world or somebody else does something something happens first then you have to do something right then you react then you respond Right? But your reaction or your action comes second. Well, he's saying better than that is to take the initiative. Act first. Act first. Don't wait, wait, wait for something to happen. And then you act. Act before something happens in the outside, especially something bad. Right? So, for example, um, I don't know. Let's say you're worried about the economy or worried about uh, bad things happening in, in the world with money. Well, don't just sit and wait for something bad to happen. Take action now so that you're ready, right? Start a business or make investments or learn skills you need. Take action first before the bad thing happens. Then you're ready. So he's saying this is actually a much more effective thing to do in life. You get better results when you take action first instead of waiting. Don't wait for someone to tell you. Don't wait for something to happen. Take action first. 
He says, our, our basic nature, our basic human nature is to act, not to wait for something to act on us. Right? Action is part of being human. It's a big part of being human. So he says, act or be acted upon. So in life, especially in social life, in business and lots of areas of life, really, it's usually better to take action first before other people instead of waiting for them to do something. Because now you are deciding what's going to happen. Now they're reacting, especially if it's com a, com a competition of some kind. And he says, if you wait, if you wait, if you don't take action first, then someone else is going to take action. Something is going to happen, right? The world keeps moving. Things keep happening. It's much more powerful for you to be the one taking action first instead of waiting. Now this idea, I'll, I'll go back. I'll talk. Well, I'm not gonna, I won't talk about my ideas yet. I'll come back. So we can finish the summary first. Okay, now here's something he talks about, something I've mentioned recently in a lot of podcasts. He says, Hollywood, really meaning the media, I would say not just Hollywood, but TV, magazines, newspapers, movies, have taught us that we are not responsible. So Hollywood, the message of Hollywood, of most movies, and he's right about this. If you look at most movies, most TV shows, the message, it's a kind of a hidden message, but it's still there and it's powerful and it's in a lot of movies, a lot of TV shows. The message is you are not in control of yourself. The message is that your feelings control you, not your mind, not your soul or your spirit that it's your feelings, your emotions. So if you feel sad, you have to do sad things. If you feel angry, then you have to act and do things because you're feeling angry. It's not true, but that's what Hollywood shows us. The best example of this in Hollywood are romantic comedies, right, and romance. So it's all about the feelings, the feelings, the feelings. Like the feelings are number one, but that's not. Your feelings are not number one. Your feelings are reactive. You, it's, it's often very difficult to choose your feelings, especially your first feelings when something happens. Often your feelings just come up. They seem automatic. You're not really choosing them. So that's not where your freedom is. That's not where your power is. So you have to be very careful about reacting from just emotion, he says. And then he talks about the best example, love. Love. So he's saying Hollywood teaches us that love is a feeling. Love is just an emotion. It's a feeling. And he'll say, like, for example, um, you know, like what in the, in the movies, they'll say, oh, I don't love you anymore. I don't feel the love. So maybe there's a couple and they're married. They have children. and Oh, I just don't feel love anymore. And then they'll divorce or something. But he's saying that's because they're teaching you this lie. He says love is not a feeling. Not real love. Real love is not an emotion. It's a value. It's a deep, 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 deep value, meaning it's a, a choice. It's part of your character. It's much, much more than just an emotion. Because sometimes you love someone, but you're angry at them. Sometimes your emotion, you feel angry. Does that mean you don't love them anymore? Of course not. Like imagine, he says his best, his easiest example, and it's a good one, is a parent with their children. So sometimes a parent, huh, they're not feeling really w lo lovely, wonderful feelings about their child. Maybe their child's being very difficult. Maybe their child's doing some really bad stuff, right? Ch children can be really bad sometimes, you know, like screaming and doing stuff, right? And maybe... In the moment, the, the mom is tired and frustrated and angry at their child. But do they still love them? Of course they do. Of course they do. So the love is not just some emotion that comes and it goes and it comes and it goes. It has to be much, real love is much, 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 much deeper than just some feeling. So he's saying proactive people understand this. Proactive people understand that values, kind of these higher choices are more powerful and more important than just 
feelings, emotions. Feelings and emotions come and go like weather. Like rain and sun and snow. Okay. Next section. Uh, now our next section kind of changes the focus, changes the topic a little bit. Next he's, uh, so we have this idea. He, he's now, now we kind of understand proactive. What does it mean for us? Next part is something, uh, another area, something we need to think about when we are proactive. Like how do we do it? What should we focus on? Where do we focus to be proactive, to get results in our life? And he talks about two circles. He uses the idea of a circle like a target circle, right? Two circles. One, circle of concern. And number two, circle of influence. Circle of concern and circle of influence. What's the difference? There's a nice little picture in the book. The small circle is circle of influence. And then around that is a bigger circle, and it says circle of concern. Okay? Seems clear. So circle of concern, what is that? The circle of concern, basically, it's just things that you care about. Anything in the world that you care about, that you are interested in, that you think is important, whatever. That's anything in the world that you just, that you, you just care about it. You, that's all. Concern here means care or interest. Circle of influence, influence means you can actually do something about it, right? It means you have some kind of power or influence. You can do something about that topic or that person or whatever, or that situation. That's why it's smaller, right? So I'll give you an example of the two. Circle of concern, I'm concerned about politics in America, the United States. Why? Because I'm an American, I'm an American citizen, born in America, my family is American, my family is goes back many, 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 many generations to the beginning of America. So I'm very concerned, I'm very interested in, I care about America, American politics, American economy. That's in my circle of concern. I'm interested in it. On the other hand, let's say, um, I don't know, just pick some other country. Um, I don't know, Honduras is not really in my circle of concern. I don't, I don't hate Honduras, but it's just, I, I have no connection to Honduras, right? It's, I, I have no family there. I didn't, I've never lived there. I didn't grow up there. I'm not Honduran. It's not really in my circle of concern. Therefore, I don't know anything about Honduran politics. I don't even know who the president is. I don't know anything about their economy. I, I don't wish anything bad for them, but I just, you know, I just don't care very much because it's outside of my circle of concern. Makes sense, right? Understandable. Easy. But now we get to circle of influence. Influence. Those are things where not really I have control, but that I can actually, I can influence, right? I, I have some power to affect the situation. Now, do I have power to change the American economy? Not really. Not really. It's too gigantic, too big. I am concerned about it. I'm interested in it because it will affect me. It will affect my family, but I can't really do anything about it. You know, I might have lots of ideas about how to change the American economy, how to change the system. I might have really good ideas, but I don't have any influence. There's... I'm not a I'm not a senator. I'm not certainly not the president. I'm not a super huge business person. I just don't have any political influence. Not really. I can vote, which is a tiny, 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 little tiny bit of influence, but almost nothing. That's it. That's all. So American politics, American economy, it's in my circle of concern, yes, but not my circle of influence because I really have no power in that area. On the other hand, my family is in my circle of influence, right? Let's say, I don't know, even my sister. She, my sister lives, we live far away, but, you know, I talk to her on the phone. 
I can influence her, right? By talking to her, I can persuade her, I can give her different ideas because she listens to me. Which, of course, she can do the same to me. So my sister is, she's in my circle of influence for sure because I have some kind of connection. I, I can affect her in some way and also she can me. And for like if we want to give the example of, you know, economics, money, I cannot affect, I cannot influence the American economy, not really. But my own business I can, right? I can certainly have a super strong influence, almost total control over my own business. Or if you have a job, your job, that's in your circle of influence. All right. So now you understand the difference between the two. Here's why it's important. He says proactive people focus their actions, focus their energy on their circle of influence. Proactive people, this is habit number one, focus on the circle of influence. In other words, they focus on the things in life they can control or influence. And mostly they ignore what's outside. Not completely, but mostly. On the other hand, the opposite, reactive people who are weaker, who get worse results, they do the opposite. They focus most of their energy on their circle of concern, right? These are the people who are always complaining about politics, always complaining about the economy, always focused on other people, what other people are doing. But they don't focus on themselves. They don't focus on the things they can actually control and do in their own life. They put all their attention and focus and energy on the outside where they have little power and not on the inside where they have most power. Right? So reactive people, that's why they're always blaming and focusing on the outside. So reactive people, often they feel like a victim. They feel like they're a victim because all this bad stuff's happening to them. Okay, next, the circle of influence. He mentions that what is influence? It actually is kind of three kinds of influence, right? So in, now we're looking just the circle of um, influence, right? Just that, just that middle one, the one you, can, you have some kind of control. Well, there's actually three kinds. Direct control. Some things in life you have direct control. Complete control or almost complete control. Very direct. Your own thinking, for example. Your body, what you do with your body, that's the most control, right? You have, you have direct control over that. That means you have the most power over yourself. Next, indirect control. Indirect control. Now, these are problems or situations that involve other people. So, for example, in your family, right? You have indirect control or influence in your family. You cannot force people in your family to do things. You can't make them do some things. You certainly can't force them to change their thinking. But you certainly can influence them. You can persuade them. You can, you know, you're close to them. So you do have a lot of influence. You certainly can cause changes to happen in your family. So you do have some power there. And, of course, so do they. They also have that power. But it's indirect. It's indirect. It's not, it's not 100%. And then finally, he mentions again, no control. Things you have zero control or almost no control. And that's, again, that's your circle of interest, right? Those are the things that, that are maybe you care about them, but there's really nothing you can do to change them. And then he says in this book, the first three chapters, habits number one, two, and three, focus on direct control. Just you. Just you. That's where you have the most power. So this habit, be proactive, it's focused just on you, your thinking, your attitudes. And number two and number three also, they're private. It's just you. Focus on yourself first. You have to take care of yourself first. That's where you have the most power. Then he says the next the habits after that are more like social habits. 
social skills or habits. They're focused on dealing with other people. First you deal with yourself, then you deal with other people. Good enough. Oh, and then one last point about this, these circles. The good news about uh, the circles, he says, is that if or when you focus on only what you can control, right, your circle of control, when you focus on that and you improve it and you improve it, so you improve yourself, for example, but guess what happens? It gets bigger. Your circle of influence gets bigger and bigger because as you become stronger, as you become smarter, as you become a better person, your ability to influence other people gets better. As you, let's say financially, you get more money. Maybe you build a business. So you're, it will get bigger and bigger. You will have more influence in the world. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's the good news. It won't stay this. It might be small now in your life. You might feel like I have no influence. Nobody else cares what I say. Nobody cares what I do. My influence is very small, my circle. He's like, that's okay. Focus on just yourself then. But as you focus on yourself, you get bigger, you get better. You will become more persuasive. That circle will get bigger and bigger. You'll get more power in the world. But you first have to get more power in yourself. Okay, next section. The haves and the bees. The haves and the bees. This is basically just another way to um, communicate this idea. He says people who focus on the outside too much, right? Just on what they, what they have no power to do anything about, what they can't control, what they cannot control. He says they, they use the word have. For example, I'll be happy when I have my house paid. If only I had a boss who wasn't so bad, then I'd be better. If I had more obedient kids, I'd be happier, right? If I had, because they, they, this reactive people, weaker people, they, their idea is that they need something from the outside. They need to get or change something on the outside. Then they will be happier. But he's saying proactive people, it's the opposite. They focus on the inside. They realize to be happier, I need to be, I need to be more patient. I need to be more kind. I need to be more loving. I need to be more peaceful. Right? It's, it's two ways of thinking. Looking inside to your own character, your own self, or looking outside, blaming the outside. Thinking the outside will make you happy. You have to get something from the outside. When I get more money, if I get a better girlfriend or boyfriend, if I get a better situation, if I get a better job, then I can be happy. But proactive people, which is the better choice, he says, proactive people... They focus on the inside, changing themselves, right? They realize, oh, I'm, I'm a negative person. I need to be more positive. I need to be more enthusiastic. They focus on being different, not having stuff. Finally, is it finally? Almost finally. The next section, the, the next section is... Um, Man, it's, it sounds exactly like the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> I don't know if Stephen Covey ever read the Bhagavad Gita. My feeling from this book is he probably was a Christian. But um, this section sounds like the central idea of the Bhagavad Gita. And he says this. We are free to choose our actions. Yes. We are not free to choose the results. What he's or consequences, same idea, consequence or result. What does that mean exactly? What does that mean? You think, oh, think about it. You're like, uh, well, it means it simply means this. You're free to choose, meaning you you control 
your actions. You decide. But you do not control the results. The results, we never really completely know what will happen, right? We can decide to do something, but we don't know. We never know 100% it will be successful. We, do, we, we can't do this because, we're again, we're only human beings. We're not gods. Sometimes you make a choice. It seems like a good choice. Maybe it was a good choice, but you have bad luck and still fail. Or you make a choice and something bad happens and you realize, ah, actually, it was a stupid choice. I made a mistake. So you see the difference, right? You, you choose, that's your power, choose your action. But you cannot control what happens after. You can't control the result. Of course, you try to get better results. You do your best. But still, sometimes we make a choice. We think it's a good choice. We think it's the best choice. But the result is not always what we want. And that's how we learn. Then we learn, I'm like, hmm, well, maybe it was just bad luck or maybe... Next time you do a better choice, you make a better choice. And so the idea is, and this is what comes from the Bhagavad Gita, the idea is to make your best choice, right, the most moral, M-O-R-A-L, meaning good, the most good choice, the most effective choice to get the results you want. And But also at the same time, to kind of relax about the results. So you just... Focus on making the best choice possible and then just relax. Don't get nervous. Don't get worried. Don't get too excited about the result because the result you can't control. So you just have to kind of you take a good action and then just sort of relax and let go a little bit, meaning emotionally. You just try to stay calm and, you know, if the result's not good, stay calm and just make another choice. And if the result is good, don't get too excited because it might change next time. So just try to stay calm about the results and focus your energy more on making good actions, making good choices as the best you can. Right? We do the best we can. We're not perfect. Okay, that was the last idea because the final part of the chapter is a challenge, the 30-day challenge. The 30-day challenge, he says, just focus on this idea for 30 days. We can make it a one-week challenge since we probably do chapter two next week. So this week, let's say, focus on this. So basically, focus on being proactive this week. Just focus on your actions, your choices, not on other people, not on blaming other people, not on blaming the outside world. Don't focus on things you can't control like politics. Uh, focus instead on you, especially on you, on yourself, because that you have total control over, your own thinking, your emotional mastery, your discipline, all of those things. You certainly control those. All right, that's the end of the chapter. Let's go back. I'll give you my ideas about this. And then we'll do comments and questions. So I'll go quickly with the ideas because really I think the ideas are quite clear. Uh, you know, our last book, The Alchemist, because it was more of a fiction story, the ideas were a little, you know, more like poetry and with images in the story. This is a nonfiction book. So really he's very direct about his ideas. It's not, it's pretty clear what the main ideas are, I think. And I agree with them. So again, this idea of self-awareness, I'll go back to the beginning now, quickly my opinions and ideas about this. Um, he says self-awareness is the ability to think about your own thinking. I said I had a different definition. I don't think thinking is the, the right word there. I think observe. You can, you can observe. You can be conscious of. You can be aware of your own thinking, your emotions your choices, and then you can change them. People have called this your, the kind of the that, whatever that is that can do that. Some people call that your will. Some people call that your spirit or your soul. It's higher than your thinking. It's more than thinking. In fact, it doesn't, it's, it doesn't think, at least it doesn't, that part of you doesn't think in words. 
it's the part of you that notices your thinking. The part of the part of you that can realizes that you're thinking. <laughs> it's, you kind of this is what meditation's about is trying to is being aware of that. You can be and then you can even be aware of that. You can be aware of your own awareness. It's kind of amazing when you really think about it. All right, his ideas about the social mirror, he's right about that. Don't uh we live in a oops. We live in a time period in the world now where um really around the world, probably especially with things like social media where people are so focused on what other people think. Now, all through history you can read about this. People people were always like this. It's human nature to gossip and worry about what other people think about you all the time. But I think social media makes it worse. People are so concerned, so focused on getting attention from other people, getting good attention or sometimes bad attention from other people. They're so focused on the social mirror and they ignore themselves. They don't really focus on what's inside. And because of that, they're actually quite unhappy. Okay, this idea that you have the freedom to choose, that this is kind of where your freedom is at, right? You cannot choose what happens to you. Sometimes bad stuff happens. You did not choose it. That's true. You cannot choose the result of actions. Sometimes you get bad luck. Sometimes what happens is not what you thought would happen. But you can choose what's in the middle, your action, right? What you do, what you think, how you feel, all those things you can indeed control. That's where your free will is, your freedom to choose. And that's what being proactive means. It means focusing on that, focusing on that in your life. Focus your energy on that. Okay, the next about taking the initiative. I also agree with him about that, that uh, in general, it's best to take the initiative. It's best to take action first. Now, you don't have to do this in every part of your life. Sometimes... If something's not that important, you might just feel like relaxing. <laughs> you know, that's okay. Um, but in certain areas that are very important to you, that are important for your life, it's better to take action. I mean, the simplest example of this would be effortless English. You took action. You took initiative. Right? I, no one's making you listen to me. No one's making you do the lessons. No one's making you read the book. No one's making you do any of that. You decided you took that action first. You didn't wait until someone forced you. And indeed, no one can force you with this. So that's taking action. And that's why you're getting better results and you will get much better results. It's just, it's, in general, in most cases, it's better to take initiative. In martial arts, this is very common in martial arts, uh, including things like MMA, that the fighter who takes initiative usually does better. It's not always the fighter who attacks. It's the fighter who controls the fight. Right? It's, I mean, they take action first and they force the other fighter to do something. Right? They force the other fighter to fight in a different way. This gives them an advantage. Um, a, a lot of great fighters do this. They're really good. So they, they're really good at making their opponent, making the other guy change their plan, change their strategy, change what they're doing because they take initiative. They take initiative. A lot of great champions do that. So you can certainly see it in sports a lot. Uh, yeah, it's overall in business. It's also very good. Take initiative. Don't wait. Take action. Entrepreneurs. This is very important for entrepreneurs who start their own businesses. Uh, too many people wait, 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 wait. They, they think they need to do something perfect. But actually... What they really need to do is just take action faster, take initiative. That's how you learn. That's how you get better results. And often just taking action first gives you a huge advantage. Just doing that. I agree with him about Hollywood and media in general. Definitely they send a lot of messages. If you watch it carefully and listen carefully, you get a lot of messages about 
that you are controlled by your feelings or you are controlled by what happens to you, which makes you a victim, which makes you weaker. Be careful what you listen to. Be careful what you watch for that reason. Okay, circle of concern. I think I explained this mostly already with the example, my example of, you know, America or my family. So I don't think I need to say anything more about that. And the three types of control, I agree with him again. Direct control is yourself. Your most power is yourself. Your own thinking, your own actions, your own body, your own whatever, you know, your own learning, your own skills, all of that. That's where you have the biggest power. So you must focus your energy there. You must focus most of your time there. That's where you get the biggest results in life, especially long term. And then outside of that is your social world. That's where you start to influence and persuade other people, you know, by being a good leader, a good role model, a good communicator. That's also important, but first you have to take care of yourself. And then outside of that, you know, you have very little power. Of course, you know, if you care about this, some stuff, you do what you can. You can vote. You can donate some money or some small things. But you got to focus most of that on yourself, especially, you know, for many, many years. So if you become a big, powerful person and you become the president of your country or a, a senator or something like that, then you will have a lot of influence in politics or something. But in, if you don't, then focus where you have your influence now. Focus where your power is not where you want it to be, where it actually is now. And then grow it. And I think that's it. Yep, and then the Bhagavad Gita, I already mentioned that too, about this idea of you can't control the results. So that's all. All right, it's time for comments and questions. Let's move my little screen here so I can read them. Comments and questions. One second. Give you a second to type them in. Those of you who are live on Facebook. Ah, a drink of water for me. And let's see what you have to say. All right. I'm going to go back a little bit. Oh, got some big ones here. <clears throat> All right. Let's see what people are typing. Okay, here we go. Some familiar names, of course. Nasser, 